Good morning. Uh, we'll call the case of People versus uh, Charles Merritt. Uh, record reflect uh, Mr. Merritt is present with counsel. District Attorney is present. Uh, matter is here today for a hearing on uh, post-judgment motions, and depending on the outcome of those motions, uh, sentencing. Uh, I apologize for the delay in getting started this morning. Mr. Moline, on behalf of uh, Mr. Merritt, filed uh, two, two motions. One, well, one motion uh, covering several uh, issues uh, at 9.15 this morning. So uh, I need a little bit of time to read that. And then, of course, counsel uh, wanted an opportunity to uh, discuss that briefly as to what we were going uh, to do with those. Uh, most of those issues were issues that had been brought up previously um, but uh, they weren't part of a formal motion at that point, so they are now. Uh, I notice uh, Mr. McGee is present, and uh, I think I'm going to ask Mr. McGee to wait outside. There's a possibility that you might be called to testify as to certain matters, so I think it'd probably be better if you either outside or in the back. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Dowry has his phone number. I think Ms. Rodriguez may also. Can we put him on call by a text message? I was subpoenaed to be here, so that's why I'm... Okay. Yeah, uh, they, they have my cell phone. I, 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 as long in the as you're in the area. I'm in the courthouse. I yeah, just have one other man I'm going to go check in on, and then yeah, I will be here. That's Mr. Fine. Gerard was subpoenaed as well. I didn't know if the court wants him in or out. I don't think... People are willing to put him on call as well via text as long as they're within the building. Okay, that's fine. If they, don't, if they choose not to be here. And I have okay. other cases I have to call, so I'll be sure. here as well. No problem. Okay. Thank you, counsel. Yeah. So the first issue, uh, or the first motion, is a motion for new trial. There are a couple of different grounds alleged uh, for the motion for new trial. One it alleges uh, insufficiency of the evidence to support the verdicts. A uh, second ground relates to either newly discovered evidence or evidence that uh, Mr. Moline now claims should have been put on uh, through cross-examination or calling their own expert, but uh, was not put on by uh, Mr. McGee. Uh, and then there are some additional motions for new trial based on uh, misconduct of the prosecution. So, uh, Mr. Moline, did you wish to be heard on those? Yes, Your Honor. Sure. Um, I think, for starters, the at least uh, the preferred, and I'm taking my cue from the court uh, based on our chamber's discussion, which is that um, we narrowly tailor the first issue which we want to address which is the, um, uh, the cell tower evidence. And okay. uh, in that regard, um, we do have uh, our expert that was hired uh, at the, our, our first and only expert on this issue, uh, which is uh, who's in the courtroom today. But before, I would like to set up the issue for the court, if that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> uh, the court may or may not be aware, but uh, Mr. McGee and I had kind of a division of labor. We would have one witness, or I had one witness, he would have another. He, he uh, mainly paid attention to most of the, uh, the technical issues, such as the cell towers and the uh, 
um, DNA and things of that nature. That seems to be his, um, his, uh, up his alley, let's say. And I handle some of the other stuff, the financial stuff, and, uh, some, and kind of along those lines, Your Honor, is the way we divided up the labor. So in terms of the cell tower evidence, um, I wasn't really involved in that, other than no watching it. So I didn't know the intricacies of uh, what an azimuth was and so forth, and that was Mr. McGee's. Um, so, as the testimony went on, I listened and, and uh, wasn't uh, the best uh, participant in, the, in that part of it. Um, and if the court recalls, um, our expert was also in the courtroom during the testimony of uh, Agent Bowles, the people's expert, and uh, he was, um, was able to uh, not only listen to testimony, but I believe he also had uh, a few conversations with, I don't, uh, we'll hear a little bit about that, but it was either some of the prosecutors or Agent Bowles himself. But in any case, uh, there was also discussions with uh, Mr. Merritt, uh, Mr. McGee, and our expert. Uh, and so what happened was, uh, during the course of the uh, presentation of that evidence, uh, our expert had heard that there were, I mean, was listening to the testimony and heard various uh, things that were being said, which he knew were not accurate, correct. They were not, um, uh, and some of them were uh, out, uh, misleading. Um, and we want to, uh, and as he sat and watched, one of the issues was, you know, what can we uh, do, I mean, I would like to testify about that. That would be uh, something that he felt he could contribute. A um, lot of the stuff, uh, there's background information, for example, regarding a call that was made at 1152. Because one of the important things about this case in terms of the evidence, since it was a circumstantial evidence case, um, the thing that I, we believed all along was if there was a direct link uh, to Mr. Merritt, for example, if there was blood linked to his vehicle, or if there was anything like that, that would be something that a jury could uh, seize on to. And everything that the district attorney presented was essentially a uh, circumstance that, as they as they put it, if you put it all together, but there was nothing really holding Mr. Merritt to the or tying him to the crime. It's that. 1152 call, and actually the 1130 and 1152 calls that placed Mr. Merritt in the 85 degree azimuth, which as the court recalls is on the uh, east side of the courtside tower, which leads directly to the graveside area. And um, that was, to me, uh, you know, pretty uh, powerful evidence. And the court also believed that that was powerful evidence, and cited it in denying uh, our 1118.1. So we understand the significance of that piece of evidence. Now, the evidence that was that was that we have that we kind of knew at the time, but if the court remembers, there were cell tower records that the FBI had access to that we didn't get, and the court did uh, uh, give us. One day, uh, November, or sorry, uh, uh, February 6th, the court gave us that day of the cell tower records that the FBI had access to. And those records actually uh, shed some light on some very important issues. And it turns out that, uh, and we're going to hear, I expect the testimony now from Vlad, that sets up his testimony because um, the 1152 call, when it was made, uh, the most likely interpretation of where Mr. Merritt's location would have been when that call was made was actually on the west side of the tower, um, which is where he said he was uh, all along. If, if the court recalls, even though the district attorney's office uh, continued to argue that uh, Mr. Merritt said, I wasn't there, I, wasn't, I was never in the desert, they, they said that over and over again. But what, as the court recalls, allowed us to play at least that portion of the interview where Mr. Merritt repeatedly said, if I were in the desert, I would have been at my sister's or my brother's, if I was there. I don't remember being, I wasn't at the gravesite, but if I was in the desert, I was at my 
sisters or my brothers. That, that interview lasted, I don't recall how long, it was quite lengthy, and we were able to play that portion of the interview. And uh, so the court's going to hear uh, evidence from our expert in regards to how, even though he hit on 85, which is what the records say, he actually wasn't there. And that's what, that's primarily at least uh, 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 the major part of his testimony. Now, there's also another set of calls that were made on February 8th, which the prosecution also left out of the presentation. And what they left out was the calls, if the, call, if the court recalls, that were made on uh, February 8th um, uh, on the 91, uh, at near the 91 uh, freeway. And the calls were made at 131, there was two calls at 133, and another call at 141 uh, p.m. Um, and the district attorney's office argued that Mr. Merrick hit north of the 91 and a tower off the 15 traveling north. That was the argument, which gave the jurors the impression that Mr. Merrick was traveling north at that time on, from the 15 freeway. Uh, what they left out was two calls that were at 133. Now, they did point out the 133 calls in trial. And at the preliminary hearing, they, they let, completely left it out of the... Uh, uh, testimony and the slides. They included the 133 call at on their slides, but did not address azimuth or the direction of where those calls came from. Those two 133 calls uh, occurred, um, and they hit on an azimuth zero due north. Um, now that would be an impossibility. Just like you're going to hear the. Uh, about the 1152 call. And uh, Mr. Merrick couldn't have been on the 91 freeway, which, because Azimuth wasn't a part of those uh, calls when they, when they went to February 8th, uh, Agent Bowles left out Azimuth or direction on those calls. So the, it was left at, he was just north of the 91 freeway on the 131 call. But if you throw in the 133 calls, which they left out, and you factor in the mistake that was made, which they said it was the, the calls were due north, which clearly was a mistake. Mr. Mr. Merrick couldn't be on the 91, which is right where that azimuth at the 131 is, uh, is facing, and then be uh, several miles north of, the, of that same tower uh, just a few seconds later, or a, few minute, or a minute later. That, that couldn't happen. So obviously that, there's a problem with that tower, the way the antenna is registering calls. And... Um, likely that tower was when it was either a, a mistake, an anomaly of some sort, or it was uh, crossed with the azimuth that was painted, that was at um, uh, also in a southern uh, easterly direction, which would have made uh, a nice drive on the 91 east going, I'm sorry, west going east, and then up the 15, which is far different when the, that is far different than what the prosecution argued, which was he was traveling north, uh, and they didn't mention these 133 calls, and they didn't mention the, um, the fact that the more likely scenario is that he's traveling from uh, west to east on the 91, and then he goes up the 15. And the 8th was an important day, Your Honor, because that's the day that they, they alleged that Mr. Uh, Merritt drove to San Ysidro, parked the, parked the uh, uh, Isuzu Trooper there and then drove back. So if you give the jurors the impression that he was traveling north on the 15, that's another thing that the jurors can uh, sink their teeth into. But in reality, um, we believe that, uh, and court can listen, of course, to the evidence on the technical stuff, because I think that's important, because it does show what, we, what I'm saying it shows, that, um, that if you left that out, that's going to create a... Um, a uh, an impression that he would be traveling northbound on the 15, which is exactly what they argued. Um, but in any case, with that, I just want to give a prelude to, to what areas you, you would be uh, hearing on that, and it, of course not going into everything in, this, in the uh, PowerPoint. Well, as I indicated, I would uh, permit you to mark your 
experts uh, report as an exhibit uh, for the motion and any PowerPoint that he had prepared uh, during the course of uh, either prior to or during the course of trial could also be marked as uh, an exhibit to the motion in the court. Uh, would review that, um, but I don't think we need additional testimony. I, I, well, I think the testimony part is the crucial part, Your Honor, because the, the, the way it was set up is I didn't include his original report, okay? I have, we had the slides to explain what he's going to be talking about, not the report, which I felt that if I just included the report, that would obviously be objected to. Um, so, um, and those claims are, it's, it's not something that you can just say in a motion. You have to see it. I mean, that's why, you know, Agent Bowles had slides, and that's why uh, 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 Mr. Jovanovic has, has slides. It's because you have to see how, especially when you're dealing with the uh, start and end of the calls and azimuths of these towers, so you can uh, understand what it is that is being said. So it would be limited to just to those areas so the court can see. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to permit the testimony. I will permit uh, the report and the uh, slide presentation that was uh, prepared uh, either prior to or during the trial to be marked in the court with you those. Let me, um, it's probably going to be easier to take out slides than, because I don't know how many were added since the original ones were there. So let me, if, if I could just get a couple minutes to confer which are the um, ones that were added since trial, and then I will uh, take, take those out. Okay. Okay. So you want to take a brief recess? Yeah, if we could. At this point? If we could. Okay. We'll take a brief recess. Uh, tell counsel to ready to uh, with that. And then once you have that, let me have the report in the slides. Mm -hmm. All right, the uh, record flip, we are back in session. Uh, Mr. Moline has submitted to the court. Uh, it's been marked as uh, Court's Exhibit 7 with regard to the motions for a new trial, which consists of uh, 91 pages of charts, graphs, technical data, maps, uh, technical data with regard to uh, cell phone tower records and call data records. And it indicates that there were some 40 plus additional pages to the original exhibit that was prepared for the motion uh, this morning that were not part of the experts' original uh, Report. So the court has reviewed those uh, and familiar with the uh, basic allegations that are set forth in the uh, in that document. So uh, you wish to be heard further on that issue, Mr. Moline? Uh, if the court would indulge me just um, on a couple of the, the slides that were uh, left. Sure. Uh, it's, uh, slide 73 would be the first one. I can, I'll put it up and then uh, you can have it with you there as well. What? So what page? It's, well, it, I, t I had to take out some as the court instructed, so you may not have it in or I mean, it'll be, it'll be slide 73, though. So you'll have a number at the top right. Isn't that the page number? Yes, it is, but they're, they're, not, they're not in, there's gaps, in other words, because we took stuff out.
So what you're putting up is what's in the, what you gave to me. Correct. Okay. Okay. So uh, the point that I made uh, earlier, Your Honor, is uh, the, the case is much different if there's no evidence that Chase was on the 85 uh, azimuth of the quartzite tower. Now, this represents the quartzite, quartzite tower, and this represents the a starting point of that phone call at 11.52. So when you have uh, Chase hitting on the 85 degree azimuth, that puts him literally due east, uh, right at the gravesite, essentially. Okay, that's, and of course, that would be evidence that anyone would want to uh, uh, consider, obviously, and it, and, it, and it is strong evidence of guilt, uh, because what's the coincidence, Your Honor, that he's there and um, uh, the family had gone missing just two days prior. Uh, these calls were February 6th, so in thinking about what the jury thought about it, it's pretty clear that that was powerful evidence, being right there in the call starting at um, 11.52. Now, here's the problem. The FBI never presented the ending part of the call, and if we go down a little here, you'll see the ending tower, which is uh, down here in, in uh, downtown Victorville by the courthouse, uh, on top of a Holiday Inn hotel there. That, uh, there's, that's the antenna there. And Chase's phone at the end of that call, it's a 35 second call, hits down here eight and a half miles away. That's an impossibility. Um, and Vlad's original report indicated that that's an impossibility. It could never happen. So when you get in that situation, what do you do? If you have an impossible situation, there's no way anyone can travel uh, at 960 miles per hour to get into range to be picked up by that cell. So obviously there's a problem with the antenna, and it, there could be several problems. And this was the issue that came up uh, in trial that... Uh, that Mr. Merritt wanted to be brought forward. It was in Vlad's report. Uh, Vlad had, uh, uh, Mr. Had indi had indicated that it was a impossible call. And it puts the 85 degree azimuth in question. That's what it does. And because the 85 degree azimuth uh, was the uh, start of that call, and according to uh, the report, that was the one that was registering incorrectly. You have to look at what the possibilities could be and why it's doing that. The only real explanation is that it was cross-connected. AT&T had faulty records. Um, another issue was the, the quality of the records and the data in the records that were provided. They were horrible, um, inaccurate information everywhere. Um, so it's not a surprise that you're gonna have a situation like this where there's a potential cross-connection um, situation. The other, the other thing is the records that we had from, uh, from AT&T, which were the call tower records from AT&T, if, if you notice, Your Honor, they're missing the, uh, it's a six-sided tower. The court remembers Agent Bowles uh, testified as a six-sided tower. However, according to the uh, call tower records for AT&T, you've got five sides here. So eight, AT&T's records only indicated five sides. There's one missing. When the court found out during trial that Agent Bowles had withheld or did not provide, uh, and the prosecution did not provide the records that he relied on, which were separate records that he accessed through a database that only <coughs> either the FBI or other law enforcement agencies could, could uh, access. And uh, we had a hearing. The court determined that we would get uh, at least one day, which would be the sixth of those records, which we got. And those records were pretty important. Why? Because those records that the FBI had access to did have the sixth side, and that was at 280 degrees, which would point uh, to the west, a little bit uh, northwest in this, in this section here. And that would explain the... the, uh, the the other side. The problem is, in order to be cross-connected, Your Honor, if you recall, you can't be cross-connected with a different band. The 85-degree 
azimuth is 850 megahertz. So if it's going to be cross-connected, it's got to be cross-connected with another 850 degree, I'm sorry, 850 uh, megahertz antenna. And the most likely would have been the, uh, the uh, azimuth at 340, which would be this one here, Your Honor. Uh, it would be going north-west, essentially. And if you recall, um, Agent Bowles had described the towers, even though it was six-sided, he, he indicated that it was 120 degree uh, sector size. Um, now, whether that's accurate or not, uh, that was a little bit too simplistic, according to Mr. Jovanovic. Uh, it doesn't really work that way, although that's a general uh, description you can give. But these sectors are, doesn't mean that those ranges are going to be exactly 120. Uh, in many cases, especially with a six-sided tower, you can have a much uh, condensed uh, range of coverage. Even though you might have a 120-degree sector, it doesn't mean that all 120 degrees will give you coverage. So, um, the question then becomes, if it's going to be cross-connected, what azimuth can you be cross-connected with? Well, the number three in, in this uh, section, which would have been the uh, 300 and uh, 40 degree uh, azimuth is the likely uh, candidate for cross connection and for a very good reason. Number one, if you recall, the 10 degree azimuth was bouncing back and forth between what was believed to be the 10 and the 85. There was a series of calls from 1130 to 1134 where you had this phenomenon, which again is very rare, where you have a uh, a cell bouncing back and forth between, uh, you know, starting at 85 and ending at 10, and uh, starting at 10, I think four of the calls started at uh, uh, 85 and ended at 10, and one of them started at 10, but they were bouncing back and forth. I'm sorry, started at 10 and ended at 85, and then uh, there was uh, 1130, 11 to 1134. So those calls if it's bouncing back and forth, and it's not bouncing back and forth with the 85 degree azimuth, it's bouncing back and forth to the tower, uh, to the azimuth next to it, which would be the 340. Sorry, 320, it's actually 325, Your Honor. It's not 340, it's 325. So, if Chase is not in the 85 degree azimuth, which he clearly isn't because that 1152 call is impossible, and he's likely at the number, uh, at the 325 azimuth, that puts Chase in the general direction of north-northwest, which would take you in this direction, where I'm pointing, which is kind of northwest. The range of coverage would actually give us a little bit more coverage there as well. Um, if you look at this road here, Your Honor, it's um, this road right here. It's, let me see if I can zoom in. This road right here is the um, road that uh, his sister li lives on, uh, National Trails Highway, right here. And she, her house is literally, I would say, in the direct line of that azimuth, at least in the range of there. And if you recall, Chase had maintained all along that he was in, if he was going to be in the desert, he would have been at his sister's or his brother's. So that would be a logical, another uh, uh, corroboration for what Mr. Merritt had told uh, detectives when he was interviewed, that if I was there, I would be at my sister's or my brother's. And his, her, um, his sister lives right on National Trails Road, which is this road right here. Um, and if you can see the way the 325-degree uh, azimuth is pointing, it's pointing in that general direction. So you're going to come up here and you're going to have a range of coverage as well. Uh, under Mr. Bowles' theory, which is 120, there's certainly ample coverage to be covered there. Um, but according to our expert, it's more in the range of between 65 and 90 of actual coverage uh, of, of that sector. So uh, Mr. Jovanovic actually has this, the, the sector coverage a little bit less than uh, Agent Bowles had given it. But even, in, even with 65 to 90, it's easy, his sister's house is easily covered in that area. Um, 
then we have to look at the ending call because that's really what would determine whether or not he's bouncing off the 325 degree uh, uh, tower or the azimuth. And yeah. Oh yeah. Before I move away uh, from that, Your Honor, if you see these circles here, which are the um, uh, represents two towers that were on the on the uh, call data records for the um, FBI. Okay, these two here that are circled, uh, they don't exist. They they're not there. So that's a, a huge anomaly. And why is that? Because those are potential uh, towers that can actually pick up a call if somebody's driving south on the 15. That could be another tower that could pick you up given your where, you know, depending on where you are on the 15 south. However, if you go to the site, they're not there. They don't exist. And that's why they have this kind of broken line around it, both of them. Okay. Um, then that brings us to the tower that, that uh, the, the call ends on, which as I indicated was the, they uh, called it the I-15 Palmdale Tower, which is right here in downtown Victorville. That tower, um, the call mm -hmm. ended at one, the, I'm one oh, sorry. So the ending call, Your Honor, was on the uh, I-15 Palmdale Tower. Ended Mr. At, Malina, yes. a lot of this was covered by Mr. McGee in his cross-examination. A lot of it was covered in his closing argument. There was an extensive discussion of the beginning and ending of the calls and the reasons for that. Not, not the direction, Your Honor. That's, that's, the, that's really the key. There was. Yeah. There was... Uh, the, the 10 degree and the 85 degree and the 170 degree going south towards the Victorville Tower Correct. and picking it up on the Victorville Tower. Correct. But this is really the key of the, of the direction of the ending call here. Because if you listen to you know, Mr. Merritt's statement, which was he could have, he, if he was in the desert, he would have been at his sisters or brothers. The ending uh, tower, which is here, which he hits on 330. Uh, degree azimuth, that again is, is going northwest, okay, and that was that was not testified to in trial, and that's significant because again, it points directly at his sister's house. So if he ended there, you have the real possibility that uh, Mr. Merritt could have made the 1152 call from the, the area of his sister's house, and not on the other side, which was uh, conceded to essentially by the defense uh, during trial. Um, the uh, the court actually never even got the uh, a chance to look at the uh, what it looks like in terms of uh, if you're if you're actually at the tower because that's pretty significant. Um, and this is slide eighty three, Your Honor. So, if you can see, uh, let me just uh, lower this a little. So here you have the quartzite tower up on this uh, hill. Um, and then you have the actual tower. So the, uh, you can see that the hotel is here. This is where the, the tower is actually on the hotel, on the roof. Um, and if you, if you see this, uh, it's, you have perfect line of sight. There's no geography in front of it or anything that would prevent coverage from the Quartzsite Tower. And if you recall, Agent Bowles did testify that Quartzsite, the Quartzsite Tower does have extended coverage. Um, 
because of, the, of its location and so forth. And if you look at the um, area of where his sister would live, again, you have direct, uh, not only line of sight, but you have nothing that would block uh, picking up the uh, call from his sister's house. The, the problem with, with all of this, that, and the way it went down in trial, is the jury never got a chance to hear the, the part that I just talked to the court about, which is that there's really a good explanation as to uh, uh, Mr. Merritt uh, hitting those towers. And the explanation is consistent with what he told detectives all along. There was just no way to explain the 1152 call. The significance how, is, how long do you intend to go through the 91 pages? Uh, I would say another 30 minutes. I don't think we're going to do that. Okay. You made the record with the uh, exhibit that you put on. Okay. Uh, motion for new trial is not to basically put on, I mean, we could put on several weeks worth of testimony now. We could have this report, and including the extra 40 or 50 pages that was that were not part of this exhibit, and then Mr. Bowles can have a chance to review it. He could prepare exhibits. Uh, you pointed out Mr. Bowles testified for three days, so we can have your expert testify for three or four days. We could have Mr. Bowles testify for three or four days. We could put on addition, additional evidence. That's not the purpose of a motion for new trial, either on the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel or uh, on uh, the, well, basically on an ineffective assistance of counsel. Well, I, I'll leave, I mean, that's up to the court, obviously, but um, also insufficiency of the evidence because if you take that out of the end, and I believe the court can reweigh the evidence, um, the court can look at uh, these issues, and one of the jobs that the court does at this stage of the game is determine sufficiency of the evidence. And if there's no other explanation... Sufficiency of the evidence that was presented at trial. Correct. The, which I have done, and I'll provide that analysis when we get to that point. The sufficiency of the evidence of other evidence that might have been presented is a different issue. That's a going to the issue of uh, ineffective assistance of counsel. Well, I think the court would also and have... If the court, if, if your intent is to put on an extensive evidentiary hearing, to provide all of the evidence. And of course, after uh, your expert and Agent Bowles testifies, then we would have Mr. McGee's testimony as well, uh, perhaps Mr. Merrick's testimony. So it would be an extensive uh, evidentiary hearing that would probably take more than a week. Uh, and to say the motion for a new trial, you know, on the grounds of ineffective assistance of counsel, is not designed for that type of a motion. Of a motion. Uh, the better vehicle to reach that issue would have been uh, a writ of habeas corpus where extensive declarations could have been filed. And then if the judge uh, felt there was an adequate evidentiary basis for the writ, then could hold a, an evidentiary hearing. Uh, there's many ways to... Which is set out in People versus Pope. Your Honor, there's obviously different ways to, to do it. We could argue it, and we could 
or present evidence, and ultimately it's your call. This was not an easy, when you're talking about five and a half months and you're talking about circumstantial evidence that uh, by the DA's own admission was a totality of the circumstances, but if those circumstances were either presented incorrectly or they weren't presented at all or there was some mistake or error, I think the court is allowed to take into consideration uh, those those issues. And it's not, I, I have, you know, the fact that it was a long trial with lots of witnesses necessitates sometimes going a little bit longer. I'm not asking for um, weeks or, or anything like that. So I'm, I want to uh, advocate for my client the best that I can in terms of pointing out that there was insufficient evidence and if the evidence would have come in in certain situations, it would have made a difference to the jury. It, it was prejudicial to Mr. Merrick that this evidence didn't come out, and I think it would have made a difference. But, um, you know, that's, that's I'm going to try to make my record, and I'm, I'm going to try to persuade you the best I can, and, and I'll abide by whatever you tell me to do. All right, well, if you want to quickly summarize the points you want to make from Exhibit 7, uh, I will let you do that, even though it was not filed timely, as I indicated. Uh, what you filed today was filed 15 minutes before the hearing today. Your Honor, I apologize, but uh, if you recall, I did come in early and ask for more time, which the court denied, and the prosecution waived their notice requirement. Um, so that was the that was that uh, issue, and I apologize for that. I and I, had, I, it wasn't like I sprung it on you. I told you that that was the situation I was in, given the fact that Mr. McGee uh, declared a conflict, he got off the case. Uh, so it is. Well, what it, as I think you still have had seven months since the uh, verdicts in the case, and this is all information uh, that you and Mr. Merritt had. It, there was plenty of time for you to present it in uh, a timely manner where uh, if we felt that an evidentiary hearing was necessary, we could have done that. Well, um, I tried to obviously do things in a timely manner. I tried to do it. We had a, quite frankly, Mr. McGee and I had a plan to get this thing done in a different way and it would have been done much sooner, but that changed. So I had to adjust. And I explained to the court at the time the adjustments that I would have to make. Um, and I can tell you that I did the best that I can. Well, you Mr. Can... McGee made it clear very early on uh, that due to these allegations that Mr. Merritt was making that he felt he could not continue. So it was clear from very early on that Mr. McGee would not be continuing. Um, I'm not sure about the timing on that, Your Honor, because we didn't come back until um, our first court date back was not until uh, I, I don't remember the exact date, but it was it was some it was at least two months after. Well, Mr. Um, McGee advised the court of it very early on. Well, it, it couldn't have been before we came back the first time. Yes, it was. I I don't recall that, Your Honor. It was it was. Uh, um, um, I don't have the dates in front of me, but. Uh, well, that would be news to me. It would have been perhaps done without me, but uh, and that's possible. But you know, that's uh, that's neither here nor there. There, right, there well, was an issue. If you want to yeah. quickly summarize the other points you want to make, I understand the argument about the uh, starting and ending time of the calls on different towers. I understand the argument of. Uh, multiple frequencies for the same sector, and some of the azimuths have the same uh, frequency, and some have different frequencies. So I understand that that was discussed uh, during the course of the trial, and I reviewed that testimony. That was reviewed, Your Honor, but in the context of a, a cross-connection, which is what apparently happened here. That was never discussed because it wasn't known at the time. There was no way for anyone to know at that time, except, of course, perhaps the uh, FBI who would have had those records that uh, kind of shed some light on this issue. Um, 
But in any case, going on to the February 8th uh, call, just briefly, because I've already touched on that, again, you have a situation where Mr. Merritt's clearly traveling from um, uh, west to east on the 91. And if you go to, uh, starting at uh, slide 58, because that one was addressed first. Uh, this was the um, original uh, map that Mr. That Agent Bowles did at the preliminary hearing. And in this case, um, the 131 call and the 141 call was uh, presented in, on a map. Now, when our expert, Mr. Jovanovic, pointed out in his report that the, the 133 calls were there as well, which were left out, and again, if you notice, there's no there's no directional hits on these towers. It's just two call, I mean, two um, times with hitting on those towers. And the prosecution had maintained, as far back as the preliminary hearing, that this was suggested of Mr. Merritt traveling northbound on the 15, um, presumably from so they could make the argument that he would be likely driving back from San Ysidro. Um, so. Uh, the problem is they left out the, the FBI left out the 133 calls. There's two of them at 133. And um, let's see if I have. So these were the these. This map was in Mr. Jovanovic's uh, original report. And again, you have the. Uh, You have the 131 call at the start here, which, if you can see, hits on the um, Asimov pointing directly at the 91 freeway, right there. And I'll blow that up just a little. So it's right here. So. Since direction was never brought up, the prosecution argued that Mr. Merritt hit north of the 91, near the 15, and then hit at 141, uh, due north on the 15. So, of course, that's kind of an accurate statement, but it's misleading because the tower he hits north of the um, 91, the azimuth is pointing right at the 91 freeway. And it's five and a half miles away from the uh, 15 freeway. So you have a situation where that surely looks like he's on the 91, but then you have this, the two 133 calls, which hit due north at zero. Okay? And that was left off of the original uh, presentation of the FBI. And, and also, although added to the slide, was not argued directional as to how that call hit. So the prosecution maintained the argument that Chase hit north of the 91, near the 15, and then at 141, hit was uh, definitely going north on the 15. So that's the argument the prosecution maintained the entire time. So hitting due north obviously is impossible. So then you have another situation, because he can't be traveling here on the 91 and then somehow end up up here. That's, that's, that's an impossibility again. The likely uh, situation is that he hits on this azimuth here, which is um, probably at 100, 105, right here. And that's again, and that provides for a nice orderly drive on the 91, which is what our expert would have testified to, and, and that's what this map shows, uh, traveling from uh, west to east on the 91, and then of course heading north, and at 141 he hits on this tower up here. That makes perfect sense, because if you recall, Mr. Merritt had indicated on the 8th he was at Metro Sheet Metal in the morning. Uh, he didn't testify, but Carmen Garcia testified that Mr. Merritt was at, at Metro Sheet Metal in mid-morning was uh, her answer to that when the court inquired of her when in the morning, and she indicated it was mid-morning. So that's consistent with him coming from uh, somewhere in the L.A. Basin. Um, it's certainly not consistent with coming 
uh, on the 15 from San Ysidro uh, to Ranch Cucamonga. And so that was evidence that, that should have been included in the presentation and the directional uh, azimuths should have been included as well, especially the two, one, the two 133 calls, which again point out the problems with these records. You have anomalies like this just like you had that we believe occurred on the, on the 8th. It's just another example of what is happening with these records. Then you have the, um, let's see, the call on the 4th. This was what they referred to as the flyer call. Uh, that was the term that was used because um, Mr. Merritt on February 10th had made a uh, call which uh, hit in the in Riverside, which was uh, much farther than the um, call which we call the flyer in this case. Um, let me pull up that. Uh, Slide 113, Your Honor. So that was a call at 9.32 p.m. Again, a call that the prosecution uh, took advantage of, of uh, arguing that what is Mr. Merritt, where, what is he doing, where, you know, where is he going at 9.32? Um, uh, and they made the assertion that he was on the, somehow connect, connected to the I-15, uh, which would have been, there was no corroboration for that, but it was just in uh, the arguments and the, the way it was presented with Agent Bowles that somehow he would have been on the 15 freeway at 9.32, and that's the way it was left. Um, now, Mr. McGee did hit on this issue uh, in cross-examination. Um, uh, and if you recall, Agent Bowles did admit that that flyer was possible. Absolutely. Considering the fact that on February 10th, almost double the distance, he made a call from his home and it went and it hit a tower that was uh, almost double the distance. So, that was the Lake Matthews Tower, right? Correct. Right. It was actually farther than Lake Matthews. That's another yeah, issue. I, it's, yes. I, I, I reviewed that. Okay. And you're right, Mr. McGee did discuss with Agent Bowles that the February 4th, 9.32 p.m. call was consistent with uh, a call from his home that uh, hit off of a more distant tower for whatever reason. Maybe other tower, closer towers were overloaded and there was line of sight to the Miraloma Tower. And yes, it was consistent with a call from his home hitting the Miraloma Tower. Yes. Even though it was significantly, it was about almost 19 miles from his residence where there were much other, much Se several other closer towers, uh, Balls indicated, yes, it was still consistent. Yeah. Then I won't uh, go any further on that, because what was going to be argued was there was significant, uh, on the new information which I, which I took out. Uh, yeah. the, the court is correct. The, the, but remember, there's two sets of records that the experts were looking at. One was the FBI, it was called the FBI records, even though Agent Bowles indicated that those records somehow might be originating from AT&T as well. They're just kept at a, uh, uh, you know, they're stored at, with a different agency. Um, but the call tower records that we had uh, have that tower in Lake Matthews. Agent Bowles' records that we got uh, list the call um, uh, 25 miles further even south. So that was a, a pretty big uh, discrepancy in, the, in those records as well. Okay, anything else? Um, yeah. 
I was, I, something I mentioned earlier, Your Honor, that on February 10th, there was that, that flyer that, um, that uh, Agent Bowles um, testified about. So right. gonna... which, which corroborated the idea that there could be a call from the defendant's residence that is hitting a distant tower some 19, 20 miles away. Correct. So since we're on the 4th, I want to talk about the timeline of the fourth. Uh, yeah. You know, you spent over two hours. Well, I didn't. I didn't argue the whole time, Your Honor. But well, we spent over two hours on this issue, which yes. we're not going to have an extensive uh, evidentiary hearing. If after this you want to file a writ of habeas corpus and submit all of the appropriate declarations and documentations. And if the uh, red judge deems there's sufficient evidence for an evidentiary hearing, then you can have your two or three week evidentiary hearing in calling all of these witnesses. Well, we believe that uh, Mr. Mayor should have a new trial, Your Honor, because especially considering the cell tower evidence, that we believe would have had a tremendous impact on what the outcome would have been in this case. And there's really no evidence, I mean, there's absolutely no evidence, other than the bluster that we heard throughout the trial about greed and, and so forth, there's no evidence linking Mr. Merritt to this case, to, this, uh, to these murders, none. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, no matter what, what you look, you can't, in, 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 uh, in my opinion, and I'm arguing, that you can't sentence a man to life in prison for something where there's simply no evidence. Not, and if the court's going to weave a, a web of, um, of uh, words, most of the words that the prosecution put forward in this case are not true. So I think those have to be addressed right. and, instead Malene, of relying on those. Mr. Molina, you gave a closing, closing argument in the guilt phase uh, that lasted at least a half a day, maybe more. <laughs> Uh, in a similar closing argument in the penalty phase addressing the evidentiary issues that you allege uh, demonstrated uh, the same allegations you're making here. Uh, I've reviewed the transcript of those, so you, we don't, you don't need to repeat your closing arguments. I'm not repeating my closing argument, I assure you of well, that. Well, you were summarizing it. I, well... I'm highlighting certain areas that I think are important because you, you're hopefully uh, reweighing the evidence, which I believe you're doing. And I don't see the, I mean, my job is to be, my, be an advocate for my client, and that's what I'm trying to do, point out the issues where I believe the court should be looking in terms of the evidence, which show that this, that Mr. Merrick could not have done this. I mean, that's my job. So I want to do that, and um, because I know the court's going to uh, basically give their own summary of the evidence, and I think that there's, if I can point out issues to the court, um, that the court might be thinking something different about the evidence, I think that's important. Um, and I would just like to have that opportunity, because I think that if you look at it in the way that um, where certain critical evidence was either misrepresented by the prosecution or outright lied about, I think that the court should um, <clears throat> should uh, pay attention to that because there is. You've made all of those arguments. I have not, Your Honor, because it you wasn't. You made all of those arguments in your closing arguments in the guilt phase and the penalty phase. Not even close, because a lot of the lies you can't pick up right away. I mean, there was so much testimony that when you're listening to the closing, and we did make some objections, that's correct, during the closing, but there were so many misrepresentations. I would go far, as far as to say that nothing, not one thing that they argued was correct. So if the court's gonna rely on uh, specific events or whatever to, to make their decision today, I wanna be heard on that because there's nothing that we can't face that the court can tell us that we cannot face and give the court the right explanation for it. All right. I've reviewed the testimony at trial. I've reviewed the exhibits. I've reviewed the arguments. 
So I'm aware of the arguments on both sides. Again, we can spend days in re-arguing all of the issues in the trial. That's not the point of a motion for new trial. You can, you should have uh, filed a brief alleging what you believe are the insufficiencies of the evidence. Uh, you filed that this morning, 15 minutes before the hearing. Your Honor, I'm sorry, I have to interject. Counsel is projecting something on the screen that is quite irrelevant and inflammatory. I'd ask to be taken down. Uh, sure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, even though it was not timely filed, I still reviewed it. The, it covers most of the issues, pretty much all of the issues that were raised in uh, previous arguments and previous uh, motions. So I reviewed that, and I reviewed all the evidence on that. Well, um, then, we should be on the same page, because there was no evidence that linked Mr. Merritt to this case, to, this, to these crimes. And um, if the court is, is see, my, my fear is that the court's going to say this is what I, this is how I view the evidence. But I know after being able to go back and study the record and see what the prosecution did and how they manipulated uh, the evidence and, the, and their argument, I think that's important. And you may not have done that exercise. Maybe you did or maybe you didn't. I don't know. But when you go back and you see what they, what they argued and why it was not correct, and uh, I think that, that was, that's important. And they told these things to the jury, which were... You, know, you don't know it at the time that they're making it because it's, it was just too much uh, material. And the few things that we were able to catch, we did object. And by the way, the court overruled a majority of it. There was one sustained objection during closing, even though they were arguing things that were completely uh, not true. And so it was frustrating for us in that respect um, when we know that the jury's hearing things that are not accurate. And so that's what I'm trying to do now is say, hey, wait a minute, this... There's another way to look at, there's, there's a, the correct way to look at the way the, the evidence was uh, presented at trial instead of the way that they argued it. And I think the way they argued it had a big impact. As the case law indicates, there's huge emphasis on prosecutorial misconduct in the way a prosecutor argues. They're not allowed to argue false things. They're not allowed to argue... Uh, you, you argued all of that in your closing arguments. Well, the motion for new trial is a, is a way... It's, it's, it's not the same thing as a closing argument, Your Honor. It's asking the court to look at the evidence again, reweigh it, especially in light of, of what yeah, you I've done. I told you I did that. I examined the transcripts, I examined the notes, I examined the exhibits. In light of the arguments that were made in closing argument, in light of the defense evidence that was presented, in light of the cross-examination of the witnesses. So I'm aware of the arguments and allegations and position of the defense. I'm also aware of the arguments and allegations and the position of the prosecution. And I reviewed the evidence with that in mind. I understand. So I'm prepared to go on to another issue. If, unless you're going to shut me down, then I'll, I'll stop. But otherwise, I would like to go on to another issue. All right. What's that? Uh... I wanted to point out to the court specific uh, things that were actually said in closing that were incorrect and were misrepresentations to the jury, which I don't know if the court did that or not. I want Was that to... in, in your motion? It's in, in the, file? It's in the uh, slides. See, this was a, this was a, this is not a, a motion case where I can just put in words. I mean, it, the, their conduct was a pattern, and so it requires me to explain. It's not just something you can write in a motion, and that's why I chose to do it this way. Well, you you raised the issue of prosecutorial misconduct and discovery issues 
numerous times during the trial. We discussed those, and uh, the court ruled on them. So now I, you want to argue them again? Not, not the same. They're not the same arguments, Your Honor, because you don't. We don't know until you study the record afterward what they did and how they lied. At the time that you close, you don't have all that information necessarily. Uh, but it doesn't mean it, did, it didn't happen. And I don't know if you caught the same things we did. I don't know if you did. Uh, and it's my job to point that out, I feel. So that's what I want to do. And I think we have a right to do that. We have a right to have you consider that. If they lied to you and, and, and it's not pointed out to you and you use that as a part of your analysis, that's not going to... That's I'm not, what, I'm, what, I'm re, what I reviewed is not the arguments of either side. I reviewed the testimony of the witnesses and the exhibits that were admitted in the evidence. But prosecutorial misconduct is a grounds that the court can consider uh, in granting a, a motion for new trial. It's a non-statutory ground, but the court can still consider that. And, and you raised the, those issues during the course of the trial. But how, do you discuss them? but how do you know if it rises to that level if I can't point out the... Uh, it wasn't just one. And the case law indicates prosecutorial misconduct can happen with one incident or it can happen over time, uh, over the, the course of the trial. Um, it's, not, it's not just situational. It can be a pattern. Uh, and I would like to point out that pattern to you. And how long do you want to, to do that? I'll give you... I'll do... Uh, as long as you'll give me, Your Honor. If you want to cut me off, that's... But my intention is to finish what I have to tell the court and until you don't want to listen anymore. That's my, that's my goal. Well, if I had to estimate, at least on this issue, I could probably do that in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. All right, I'll give you 15 minutes. Okay. Your Honor... Okay, he wants to have a, a talk with me, Your Honor. I'm sorry? He wants to um, take a few minutes to uh, talk with me, <clears throat> if that's okay. Sure, we'll take a uh, 10 minute recess. Um, I guess maybe we'll take about a 40 minute recess for lunch since it's after 12. So we'll be in recess until uh, <coughs> 35 minutes, until 12.45. Thank you. 